May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. Amen. Happy homecoming, everyone. It's great to see you all. It's wonderful to be home. And I am thrilled about this day. Um, those kids were fantastic, weren't they? The two bears. The 1 p.m. ensemble here at 9 and 11 15. Outstanding, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. The entire campus festoon in blue and green for our homecoming theme of Blue Green Hills of Earth and the parish council and Gary Leonard who made all this wonderful stuff happen. A little applause for them. And I cannot tell you what it means to come home to a full staff so thrilled about Francisco Garcia, Sally Howard, Janine Scononi, and John Depphouse. It's just wonderful to have these folks in place. Everything and everyone belongs. Everyone belongs. That's the great good news that pulses at the heart of All Saints Church. Everyone belongs and everything belongs in God's creation. Richard Rohr says that if you and I have anything in our thinking that we've put outside God, then our picture of God is too small. For God includes everything. Everything belongs in God. God is simply a word we use for that dynamic, mysterious, vast force that created and sustains the creation which we call the universe. Everything is united in one verse. That is why Christian scriptures find Jesus repeatedly telling stories about people and things that are lost. Jesus knows that at the heart of every person's dysfunction, every person's wrongdoing, every person's sin is an ignorance and a misery that stems from not having found love to be the organizing principle and dynamic of their lives. This truth applies not only to the personal and psychological realm of our lives, but to the social political realm of our lives. All oppression, all injustice, bigotry, discrimination, and violence to others and to this planet stem from the lack of understanding that everyone belongs and everything belongs. Not only in this blue-green hills of earth, but also in the entire universe. So today at All Saints Church, we celebrate Homecoming Sunday. And the thousands of churches across the land who start their new 2013-2014 program year with some kind of kickoff Sunday in September. And in fact, some are called kickoff Sunday. Some are also called rally Sunday. There are hundreds of names. I'm attracted to homecoming Sunday for us because it lifts up this central human need you and I, all of us, have to belong, all of us and all parts of us. Those of us who have found at All Saints our way, our sense of belonging, our spiritual headquarters, we welcome all here with a warm, embracing rejoicing with the belief that you can find your sense of being at home in the world by being on the journey of belonging here with us at All Saints. And we take that radically here. I've been telling the story that the last Sunday before my summer break, I was greeting people after the 1115 service and this wonderful woman holding in a papoose her baby and her husband with her. And she said, 
I'm Buddhist, my husband is atheist, and we've heard you include everybody here, so we're here at All Saints. I said, yes. That ongoing journey of finding a way for everyone and everything to belong is for us rooted in the ongoing conflict that Jesus had with the religious authorities of his day. We don't have any story of Jesus eating or feeding people or hosting a meal or hanging out with other people in which he excluded anyone. And that's exactly what got Jesus into trouble and kept him in trouble. Jesus ate with the wrong people. (laughs) He hung out with the wrong people. Tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and all the folks who were excluded from the religion and the politics of his day. Richard Rohr writes in his new book, Yes, and, when any church defines itself by exclusion of anybody, it is always wrong. It is avoiding its own vocation which is to be the Christ. The only groups that Jesus seriously critiques are those who include themselves and exclude others from the always given grace of God. If Jesus is the embodiment of God and the way God works in creation, If Jesus is the embodiment of the way God's truth looks and the way love works, and I happen to believe that Jesus is that embodiment, then if you and I want to see how the universe works, we look at Jesus and his refusal to exclude. Jesus is always including. Jesus even includes the excluders which I think is pretty tough to do. That's radical inclusion. Inclusion even of the exclusionists. I believe, however, that that is the secret to the energy that I receive and feel when I'm in worship or in a meeting or when I get to touch base with all saints. All are included and all is included. When my wife, Hope, And our kids and I decided to officially join an Episcopal church in Atlanta many years ago. The moment we decided was when we turned to one another after a church retreat and said, let's join. We didn't have to change the way we acted, talked, behaved from the moment we left our house to the moment we were in the midst of the worship and the social events of that church. We want that kind of integrity in our lives. We were saying at the time, everything about our lives belongs, and we found a place where everything belongs. We had come home, and it is that homecoming energy we celebrate today as we kick off this new program year here. Now, I do want to celebrate the fact that homecoming is not just one Sunday, it's an ongoing process. Homecoming is the ongoing process of forgiving and including all the parts of yourself and all the parts of others, finding a way for every part of life to find its place in the tapestry of your life. Richard Rohr says that this process includes every part belonging, every part forgiven, even the tragic parts now seen as necessary lessons. He notes that healthy elderhood is this forgiving and including and discovering that you are really already home. These elders he's talking about are at home in their own bodies, their own lives, and their own minds. Home is no longer a geographic place. It is the place where everything belongs 
and everything can be held. And everything is another lesson and another gift. St. Gregory of Nyssa, one of the Eastern fathers of the church, defined sin in the following way. Now it helps me as a recovering fundamentalist (laughs) to think of this following definition of sin as different from the definition of sin I grew up with and was spiritually abused by. When Jesus describes in the parable that there is joy in heaven over one repentant sinner. Jesus is not talking about somebody who's now sorry for having danced too much or consumed too much, whatever. Jesus is talking about the following definition of sin. Gregory of Nyssa says, sin is the refusal to keep growing. The saint and the elder, the true elder, grow from everything, even and especially their failures. My wife Hope and our adult children were given an amazing present to celebrate Hope's birthday last week. The gift was to be flown to Ireland and to have restful days of naps, walks, conversations, much laughter, and many pints of Guinness beer. (laughs) Which we learned in Ireland is frequently called vitamin G. (laughs) Before leaving Ireland, we bought souvenirs. And one of the souvenirs I purchased is a beautiful bronze plaque of a four-word saying by Michelangelo. The great artist said this when he was 87 years of age. The plaque reads, I am still learning. That's homecoming in motion, friends. Homecoming is forgiving and including all the parts of yourself, all the parts of other people. It is the never-ending search mission of finding a way for every part of your life to have its place in your wholeness and in your integrity. And there is a vocational reason for all this. There's something great at stake in all this. Because you see, Jesus had labored to see that everyone and everything belongs. That is one of the things that he accomplished internally during those 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. And he did this not just for his own righteousness, but he did it so that he could proclaim by being an embodiment of inclusive love and homecoming, bravely and courageously extended to every person he encountered in life. It is a maxim of truth that you and I can avoid hurting others to the degree that you and I have found inner healing of our own hurts. But to the degree that we don't find a way to heal our own hurts, we will pass those hurts on to other people. Hurtful people hurt. You and I can also help other people find their own homecoming to the degree that you and I have come home to the place where we are learning that everyone and everything belongs. These parables this morning show us that Jesus believed that the universe, and you and I can count on the universe, always is working, searching to find us in the places 
where we have become lost to addiction or to trauma or to resentments or to isolation or to poverty or violence or injustice. God is like the good shepherd carrying on a divine search mission for every lost sheep until all are found. God is like the woman who never gives up looking for the lost coin in her house. And the joy that takes place every time you and I are lost or something inside of us is lost, that joy is explosive and life-giving. The angels sing. That's the way the universe works. Grace is always active and working to help you and me find our way, and we can find our way where we are lost. Once we come home to the place of putting ourselves at the disposal of God's grace and love, our lives are in business, my friends. You show me someone whose life is in business, someone whose life is on mission, and I will show you someone whose life has become the joyful business of helping others find their way home. Someone who has become a walking homecoming themselves. So much of this journey is understanding that we not only have this inner spiritual journey, but we have political, social responsibilities for us to help us find our way as a people and as a nation. Early, when we were on vacation in Ireland, the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney died. My favorite poem of his we read in this liturgy. Thank you, Marianne, for such a great rendition. That poem notes that our homecoming place is possible. It's a place beyond revenge where hope and history rhyme. And the universe is conspiring, working for us to find our homecoming in that place beyond revenge where hope and history rhyme. Today is the 50th anniversary of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Four little girls were in their Sunday school classroom and they were murdered by that bomb. Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Denise McNair perished at 10.22 a.m. September 15, 1963. Three days after the bombing, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached the funeral sermon in which he exhibited, according to my argument in this sermon, he exhibited the fact that he was a walking homecoming. As I read these paragraphs, Think of this wise walking homecoming. Knowing that everything and everybody belongs. Dr. King spoke of the little girls. They died nobly. They are the martyred heroines of a holy crusade for freedom and human dignity. And so this afternoon, in a real sense, they have something to say to each of us in their death. They have something to say to every minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. They have something to say to every politician who has fed his constituents with the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. These four little girls have something to say to a federal government that has compromised with the undemocratic practices of Southern Dixiecrats and the blatant hypocrisy of right-wing Northern Republicans. They have something to say to every Negro who has passively accepted the evil system of segregation and who has stood on the sidelines in a mighty struggle for justice. These four little girls say to each of us, black and white alike, 
that we must substitute courage for caution. They say to us that we must be concerned not merely about who murdered them, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophy which produced the murderers. Their death says to us that we must work passionately and unrelentingly for the realization of the American dream. Now get this note of inclusion, my friends. Dr. King said, and so my friends, these little girls did not die in vain. God still has a way of wringing good out of evil. In spite of the darkness of this hour, we must not despair. We must not become bitter, nor must we harbor the desire to retaliate with violence. No, we must not lose faith in our white brothers. Imagine the bravery of someone standing up and saying to this crowd, that we must not lose faith in our white brothers. Somehow, he said, we must believe that the misguided, the most misguided among them can learn to respect the dignity and the worth of all human personality. To have the hope for the most heinous perpetrator of atrocity that he or she can become a Michelangelo and still learn. Here, Dr. King had the courage in the homecoming to say that even perpetrators of bombing children could be redeemed. This past week in America and in the globe was for, from my perspective, an amazing example of the world taking a step toward coming home to itself. Now, I'm old enough and experienced enough to know that progress takes place three steps forward and two steps back. But last week was one step forward. There were other little girls and little boys who had been killed by chemical weapons in Syria. And in the face of that, the drumbeats of war increased their volume. Let's retaliate with force. Let's go to war. As Andrew Basevich said on the Bill Moyers program Friday night, this veteran of many wars, a man who lost his son in the Iraq war, he said, we needn't be naive about just having one precision bomb or two, and then leave. Once you've bombed in retaliation, you've gone to war. But instead of being a war with Syria this morning, homecoming has prevailed in saying something that is beyond revenge. We have learned that doing something about the deaths of children, you've got to do something does not have to involve retaliation. You can actually accomplish something, do something. You can act by negotiating and using diplomacy. And this morning, we have the hope of Syria joining the convention of those countries who have put a stop to chemical Warfare. We must never be modest about the power and influence to bring the world home that we have in speaking up. Look at Moses speaking up to God this morning. In that first lesson, God was going to retaliate with wrath and violence, and Moses talked him out of it to the degree that you and I can say to the world everything belongs everyone belongs 
we can find a place beyond revenge to live. We can be a part of a sea change. You and I can find our way to be walking homecomings. We can help the entire world come home to a place where hope and history rhyme. Happy homecoming, sisters and brothers. Amen. Amen.